Thank you for coming. It's a big crowd. I'm feeling like Donald Trump, admiring the size of the crowd. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my orchard, and the title is Thoughts from My Orchard, or Everything I Need to Know I Learned from My Fruit Trees. My first memory of fruit trees was in Alston, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. My family lived on the first floor of a double-decker owned by my Uncle Fred, whose family lived above us. In the backyard, there were apple trees. These were not pretty trees, but grew unkempt. The apples were all rotten and were only good for throwing at other kids. <laughs> As young adults, Debbie, my spouse, and I moved to upstate New York. There, we learned about the beauty of apples. The orchards spread as far as the eye could see. We drank cider from a working wooden press and bought a single apple so large that only one was needed for a pie. Still, apple growing was a mystery to me. When we moved to New Hampshire for a new career opportunity, Debbie and I lived near her parents, Skip and Mildred. They had purchased a 12-acre site in Milford, New Hampshire. They had visions of the apocalypse and wanted to be self-sufficient. Together, we planted large gardens and raised all sorts of vegetables. It was a tremendous amount of work. New England soil is notoriously rocky, and this was classic New England soil. And just when you were supposed to be working the soil for planting, it was black fly season. Black flies are nasty. They are tiny and do not give the audible warning that mosquitoes do. Their bites are painful. We often worked in the garden with nets over our faces. Vegetable gardening did not excite me, but I did learn that it was possible to grow things. The local supermarket was not the only source of food. When we bought our house in Drakett, Massachusetts, we had a small garden to grow tomatoes and cucumbers. Tomatoes are the only thing worth growing in the garden. Their flavor is not matched by the store-bought imitation. But as far as I'm concerned, other vegetables taste just as good from Stop and Shop. <laughs> Skip, my father-in-law, was disappointed that I had not developed a green thumb. He was getting into fruit trees and suggested that I plant some. Since we had a new home, the landscaping was minimal, growing fruit and planting flowering trees appealed to my efficient side. I could do landscaping and get an edible byproduct. So on a dreary, cold February day, I ordered the trees, one peach, three apples, and two pear trees. Interestingly, it was required to buy more than one apple tree. They need to cross-pollinate to uh, flourish, but peach trees are a solitary breed requiring only one plant. I particularly remember the description of the peach variety, Reliance, developed at the University of New Hampshire and designed to survive cold New England winters. The trees came from Miller's Nursery in April, and they were quite unimpressive. They were thin twigs, about four feet tall and three-eighths inch in diameter, not much wider than a pencil. However, the root structure was substantial, long roots with many, runder, with many runners. The roots were wrapped with a kind of wet seaweed. There was no soil around them. They had been pulled from their homes with not a speck of dirt to remind them of their past. The trees that I bought were called semi-dwarf. They, they were hybrid trees. The tops were from dwarf stock, so they would not grow too big to harvest the fruit with ease, but the roots were from standard-sized trees, so they would grow deep into the rocky soil. Deep roots and modest foliage, a tribute to the Puritan ethic. The sign of this hybrid was a bulge at the bottom of the trunk where the roots and trunk met. This is where the two trees had been spliced together early in their lives. It was important to plant the tree below the bulge you do not want the roots from the dwarf foliage taking over, giving the tree only modest support. Skip's advice and the brochure from Miller's Nursery were quite clear. Dig a good hole for the trees. 
It's a New England saying, dig a $5 hole for a $1 tree. With inflation, it's now a $200 hole for a $40 tree. <laughs> the hole should be big enough to allow the roots to spread out. You want the roots to spread laterally so the tree has support in all directions and making it easy and make it easy for the taproot to sink deep into the ground. This is a great concept, but in our yard, finding a three foot in diameter a hole that can be dug three foot deep is not easy. Trying to find six of them in a space you would like to call an orchard is nearly impossible, but I, I did my best. With a pickaxe and crowbars, I used every bit of simple machine technology from my physics education to prepare the holes. They were not perfect, but I thought them adequate. After digging the holes, they were partially filled with a mixture of topsoil, manure, and peat. The ground around the roots could not be too rich. You don't want to burn the roots, and you don't want the trees growing too fast so the root system can't support the foliage above. It took two days, but the trees on the ground were in the ground and staked against the wind. The fruit trees were no more impressive in the ground than they were in the package. My orchard looked like broken sticks poking out of the ground. For the first two years, the trees were barren, but growing. All their energy was directed to building foliage and roots. They were not distracted with flowers or fruit. The trees took little care during this period. They were small and manageable. The tips of damaged branches were clipped in April. The trunk trunks were wrapped during the winter to prevent mice from chewing the bark when there was nothing better to eat. This wrap also protected the delicate bark from the sun reflecting off the white snow. During the summer, the trees required infrequent spraying, just enough to keep the aphids from eating the tender new leaves. Then it happened. The trees reached adolescence. One May, each tree had a dozen blossoms. Fruit set on only a few of them and most of that fell off in a month. But in September, we ate two apples from our trees. Those apples tasted great. <laughs> As the trees grew, so did my work and my knowledge. Instead of one minute to spray the leaves on the branches, it took 10 minutes to ensure that each leaf had been soaked. But still, my respect for the orchard grew. I knew that although I had to spray the trees every two weeks, to have healthy foliage and handsome fruit, it was still a lot less work than a vegetable garden. There was no constant weeding, watering, and treating for garden pests that could destroy a crop in a few days if left uncontrolled. I am ambivalent to spraying trees with fungicides and pesticides. I hate working with poisons, but I know that if I don't spray, the fruit will be rotten and loaded with bugs. I tried to minimize spraying, pushing frequency to every 20 days instead of every 10. It is most important to spray the trees with oil and sulfur before leaves appear. It is also important to spray the fruit just after the petals fall from the flowers. This is when the fruit is most susceptible to insects. Waiting until after petal fall showed some concern for the pollinators. Pruning the orchard became a rite of spring. Each March, before the ground awakens, the trees must be shaped. At first, I was cautious about removing healthy branches. Those limbs would produce beautiful flowers and fruit. Why should I cut them off before they did their job? But the gardening books were clear, prune. It is not as important to do it right as it is to do it. Without pruning, the trees would become overgrown. Light would not be able to reach the center of the tree to produce healthy fruit. Still, it was difficult to prune enough. Even though I removed a barrel of branches, it was clear in July that I had not removed enough. The trees were too dense. You could not see through them. The northern spy apple tree was particularly stubborn, requiring extensive pruning. Its branches shot straight up in the air. It looked very strange, like a candelabra 
with a hundred slender wicks. But the worst of it wasn't the looks. It was the fruit production. Fruit is not set on vertical limbs. It requires horizontal branches. The branches must be trained by either hanging weights on them, staking the branches to the ground, or pruning them into a horizontal position. Hanging weights in a windy location didn't work very well, and staking the branches to the ground made mowing the grass a chore. So pruning became the preferred choice. It took years to get enough branches horizontal to produce fruit. In fact, one May, I threatened, if you do not pr produce fruit this year, you are firewood. <laughs> that motivation produced about a dozen apples. <laughs> Each May, the orchard is alive with white and pink flowers. Bees do their job of gathering nectar and fertilizing. By June, small fruit can be seen on the trees. As the apple fruit mature, many of the apples would drop to the ground. If this is nature's way of reducing the stress on the trees, the apple tree knows how much fruit it can support and aborts that which would be too big a strain on its system. It seems that apple trees have learned to live in harmony with their ability. This is not so for the peach tree. Peach trees are foolish. A mature tree sets hundreds of fruit. The result is that each piece of fruit is very small and susceptible to disease. In addition, the tree puts all its energy into supporting the survival of the fruit. It spends no effort on producing new wood growth. Since fruit is produced on the new growth from the previous year, this, there is no fruit the next year. The tree goes into alternating years of producing many small pieces of fruit and years of producing new growth. It is not very satisfying for either the tree or the person cultivating the tree. <laughs> Peach trees need a helping hand. Each June, fruit must be removed from the branches. Not just a few pieces of fruit, but more than half. This is a very painful process. Life is being terminated before reaching fruition. But intellectually, we know it's the right thing to do. I get Debbie to help me with this task. I cannot take the responsibility alone. <laughs> it is a very strange emotion. We become almost violent as we suppress our feelings of compassion for the fruit. Even as we feel we've abused the tree, by August, when the branches are weighted to the ground, we know that we were not severe enough in terminating the fruit. Each year we vow to be more extreme, and each year we are too compassionate. Fruit trees are hardy. In August of 1990, a hurricane named Bob came through the north. It was a particularly bad storm. It had rained for several days before the storm, softening the ground. Trees were in full foliage. The wind came in strong from the northeast. It was too much for the trees. Three of them were blown over. Two apple trees were still laden with fruit. After the storm, I drove metal stakes deep into the ground north of the trees. I took heavy rope and tied the trunk to the, to the stake and righted the trees. It took several weeks to get them fully upright. Amazingly, the trees produced apples that year and continued to live. After two years, the stakes could be removed from the Macintosh tree. The peach tree was still staked, but it was healthy and continued to grow. The Granny Smith apple tree wasn't so fortunate. 1995 had been an amazing year for the tree. It had produced a bounty of apples and had been picked clean. Those apples were hard and tart like the green apples of my youth. This time it was a, a September storm that brought the tree to the ground, ripping the stakes out of the soil. The storm was fatal, splitting the, truck, the trunk up the middle. As I removed the tree from the orchard, I saw my responsibility in the death of the tree. There was a large rock one foot underneath the center of the trunk. 
The tree had never been able to set a taproot. It had survived, but it was not as strong as it could have been. Not as strong as it should have been. At the time of planting, I must have been frustrated by all the rocks in the orchard and thought that the hole would be good enough. A $10 hole for a $20 tree. The year 2000 was my last personal experience with an orchard. We moved to Andover with a front yard with rocks and fill in full sunlight. It was not as hospitable for trees as the moist cow pasture of our Drake at home. However, the orchard tradition of the Zaka family continues. Our older son George and his wife Liz, his wife Liz have had a dream of living in Vermont where they could be self-sufficient and prepared for the apocalypse. While Debbie's parents thought the apocalypse would be caused by Democrats, George thinks it will be caused by Republicans. <laughs> In either case, Vermont seems an ideal place to live. In 2020, he convinced his brother Chris to support their dream. In the middle of the pandemic, George, Liz, and Chris bought a home in Wilmington, Vermont. It is a second home for now. Because of strict COVID protocols in Vermont, George and Chris could not go inside the home until they had bought it. Liz had stayed long enough in Vermont to see the entire home. But that was not a big problem, since the grounds were what they were really interested in. Have you got that on HDMI one? Great. And the grounds are spectacular. The yard is sloped and moist with water running into a pond. Now in their third year, with the skills and effort of all three owners, they have implemented their dream. The backyard has raised beds They have raised beds for vegetables and native plants to attract pollinators. Beds of strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries, and fruit trees. The roof of the house has solar panels that charge batteries in the garage. They can live off the grid as long as the sun has shined in the last 48 hours. While I am ambivalent to spraying fruit trees, George, Liz, and Chris are adamant against using chemical pesticides. They buy and eat organic and are very careful about what they put in their bodies. They are following guidance from the Holistic Orchard by Michael Phillips to manage their orchard organically. The orchard is designed and cultivated to promote the symbiotic relationship between various types of fungi in the ground and the tree roots that allow the tree to take maximum nutrition from the earth. Rather than using chemical sprays, the leaves are sprayed with neem oil, unpasteurized fish liquid, seaweed, and a complex brew of beneficial microbes that promote the tree's natural defenses and keeps the trees covered in good organisms so diseases can't take hold. When I sprayed my fruit trees, there was an acrid chemical smell. I suspect their yard will smell like low tide. <laughs> Perhaps not pleasant, but natural. Their first step was to make their yard attractive to pollinators. While their home already had attractive plantings, they added a large flower garden of nat native plants that is visible from the street. Further back on the property, they planted wildflowers. These provide long-term sustenance for the pollinators that are needed to fertilize the fruit in May. This is a photo of a recently planted peach tree. The rocks removed from the ground when the hole was dug are now a border. 
Larger boulders were rolled down the hill and are now part of the retaining system for the raised beds. Wood chips retard weeds, allow rainwater to reach the roots, and provide natural nutrients to the tree as they decompose. There is a balance involved with the material used to backfill the newly planted tree. It should be a good environment for the tree, but not too good. Too good and the tree will not be encouraged to send roots beyond the border of the original hole. This is, this is an apple tree a couple of months after planting. Deer were eating the trees, so they installed fencing to protect the trees. It is likely fencing will be required long term because these trees never get very tall. They are bred to be harvested from the ground, which happens to be perfect height for the deer. The plantings at the base of the tree are the start of an ecosystem to promote sim the symbiotic relationship between the fungi on the ground and the tree. Over time, more plants will be added to encourage predators and parasites to protect the tree. Other plantings will be made away from the trees that are sacrificial in that pests will prefer to eat those leaves than to eat the leaves of the fruit trees. Garlic will be planted at the base of the tree to deter moles and voles. The organic, or, the organic orchard has a very complex understory of plants to support the health of trees. Michael Phillips even has good things to say about the dandelion's ability to mine potassium. These are their plum trees. It is a planting that abides by UU principles. It is diverse with six varieties the diversity promotes cross-pollination. The trees are planted closer together than is typical of an orchard. The branches are expected to grow into adjacent trees to provide support. There were some full-size apple trees on the property. They have not been tended and have become too dense. The fruit is small, about the size of strawberries. A friend of theirs made apple crisp, but it was a chore to peel all those tiny apples. Georgia started a three-year program to prune the trees back to productivity. I have learned a lot from fruit trees. Preparation is the, is the key to success. Dig a $200 hole always. If you can't dig a good hole where you want to plant, move the tree. If you can't move the tree, plant berries that don't need tap roots. Experts are consistent about the advice for preparing your orchard. Life is more complicated, so you may not know how to prepare. Prepare anyway. You're bound to get some things right. I learned, be proactive. It's easier to discourage pests, scales, and fungus by pruning and spraying oil and sulfur early in the spring than it is to cure these ills once they've been established. Pruning is particularly important. It, let light, it let, lets light in and allows the tree to breathe. Pruning sets limits and helps the tree know how much fruit it should produce. Look for help. Make your yard hospitable. Make your yard a hospitable place for pollinators. Bees and butterflies are required to pollinate the fruit. But also welcome birds and ladybugs. These are natural predators for aphids and worms. You could try to handle these pests on your own, but why not get nature to help? Accept blemishes. Not every piece of fruit will look as good as the wax-coated specimens on the stop and shop shelf, but they will taste better. Cut out the bad spots or peel the apples if you must. Nobody is inspecting each piece of peach as they devour the pie. 
be prepared for loss. Some fraction of the fruit will be lost to the birds or some pest. It is natural. Those beings are part of the web of life. You should accept your contribution to that web. In very bad years, you may lose the entire crop to some catastrophic event. Even the best preparation or proactive program cannot stop some calamities. Clean up and get ready for next year. Share. In good years, a home orchard produces more fruit than one family can or should eat. My most joyous times with an orchard came when we brought baskets of fruit to our UU congregation to share during hospitality hour. Even better were the times that Debbie baked four peach pies for summer potlucks. While we don't have peach pies to share today, Debbie has baked some soul cakes referenced in the gathering music made popular by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Join us on the portico for apple cider and soul cakes and share your stories of growing your own food. Those of you on Zoom will just have to talk about food. <laughs> Thank you.